feel the tension in your mind when the, t when the craving is arising, when you are beginning your practice, beginning to learn to do this. Now, this is because um, what happens is, we're gonna draw uh, Freddie here and see how I do this time, okay. This is Freddie. Mm. Oh, come on now, don't laugh at my drawing because I'm not going to have a job as an artist. But this is this Freddie, okay? And, okay, he has his uh, yogi pants on, right? And, okay, this is, this is Freddie. We're just going to, so he doesn't have a flat head. He goes like that there. We'll give him a little cap or something, okay. Um, okay, this is Freddie, and here's, here's Eddie. Eddie's here, and... Whoops, he's got a little wide here. <laughs> Okay, well, let's see, we can, we can take a little bit of that off here. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, and this is, this is Fred, this is Eddie. Okay. Come on, this is getting, and those of you who know me know that this is getting better and easier as I go on so many years doing this, okay? So these two, now these two people, you know, here we go. That's not so good, but you know, here. These two people are meditators, and the idea behind this is, um, the idea behind this is to understand that they are both starting out as meditators who have a lot of, they have a lot of uh, initial tension in their body. So we're going to say that when they start out, let's say that they, they come in off the street and they both have this much tension in their body and their mind, okay? Now, um, this one, he is practicing another practice and in this case, we're talking about the hindrances and, and we're talking about the craving. How do you tell when the craving comes up? Well, first we have to examine how it works. If I'm talking about cra craving that's rising up, how, they have this much to start out with and the craving would have to come up above this, above, it would have to come up above this level for them to feel it. So if this person is practicing, we'll do it like this. This one is practicing something else, and this one, this one's practicing twim, okay? And this one is practicing uh, something else, just something else, a, a, another practice. I will just say another practice. Ooh, that's terrible. Okay, <laughs> another practice. And what's happening here is this person is going to have um, the, uh, the um, something comes up in their mind. Something happens where they have either heard something or see something or smell something or taste something or they feel a sensation. And when the sensation occurs, there is a, 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 a tension already in their body. They don't think about tension. You know, I had somebody tell me, there's no way that you can feel tension in your head. That's just silly. Well, let's see why that's silly. Because when this person, this person might believe that, okay? And they're correct. Because what happens is when a hindrance is rising up and it's bothering him so that he cannot be still in his meditation, he feels like he has to move. He feels like he has to do something, okay? What he does is he tries to subdue, he tries to destroy, eradicate, suppress, 
subdue or uh, suppress or subdue or push down the hindrance. And once he pushes away the hindrance, I mean forcefully pushes it away. Once he pushes it away, then he comes back right away. He comes back to his sitting. And in his case, there was no change in his level of his uh, tension and tightness in his head and in his mind. There wasn't. And so when he's, this person says, you can never see that, I believe that, and I'll show you why. Now, we're going to look at what happens to the twin meditator instead. The twin meditator, he starts out with this much in his head too, just like this one, okay, and in his body. But when something comes to him that, that pulls away his, his uh, attention, he does something else. He practices right effort. So what he does first is he simply lets go of his attention off of this. He simply lets it fall away or he leaves it alone. So in this case, he abandons it. He relinquishes it. He leaves it alone and he just relaxes. And when he releases and relaxes, that relaxed step is everything. It makes the difference between Eddie and... Um, and um, whatever the other guy's name is. <laughs> it, 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 the tension of, of um, Ed, Nettie and Eddie, okay? So what happens to Eddie that is so special is every time he uses these six steps, the six R's, what does he do? First, he, he releases. He releases, then he relaxes. First, he re recognizes, he recognizes, it. he sees it, recognize. Nine, he recognizes he's being pulled away, so he releases his attention off of it, and he relaxes. Now, every time he relaxes this, every time he does that, this goes down a little bit. And then he... He, relax, he re releases, he recognizes it, release, relax. He smiles, he smiles, and he returns. We can say this another way. We can say he sees it, he lets go, relax, smile, and come back. Relax, smile, and come back. And as he's doing this, relax, smile, and come back. A few things are happening to him that we can see in the brain and they can document what's happening. When he releases holding on to something, when the tension was up, you know, when he, when he releases, then the tension lowers a little bit. When he smiles, it lightens his mind. Go ahead, smile for me. All of you need to just smile. And when you smile, tell me how your mind feels when you smile. Just smile for me and then tell me how your mind feels when you smile. It immediately uh, touches the two lobes in your brain and they relax and separate a tiny bit and you feel lighter. That's what happens. In fact, when the, the actual uh, uplifted joy happens in the first jhana we talked about, we think what's happening, and the neurologist says this is quite possible, that when these two relax and they separate just a tiny bit like this, right here inside is the, um, the gland which excretes the endorphins, right? The gland, that, that's what's it, uh, letting the endorphins out. And the endorphins are like morphine, and they make you feel light. They make you feel happy. And when you are at a birthday party and everybody's happy what they're doing, they're relaxed, happy, and they're really happy if they're really letting go and they're being happy. That's why they look so happy. They're happy because they're uplifted, uplifted. So now let's, let's see what happens. This one, he's going to practice a second time. And this is the first one. And here's the second one that is, is bothering him. And the second one, the second one that's bothering him, this purple one, he's going to treat it the same way. He's going to let, he's just going to push it away, throw it away, or press it down and try and stop it. When he's finished, he's going to come back and keep going in his practice. So again, this up here, this does not lower anymore. But then 
We've got Freddie over here. We got Eddie here, right? And Eddie, he has another hindrance come up, but he knows some things about hindrances. He's been told some knowledge the Buddha left for us about hindrances. And hindrances, they have food. They have nutriment. They come to you because why? Because they want you to pay attention to them. And if you hug them, and say, hello, how are you? <laughs> then they're gonna stay there and get bigger and stronger and stay there longer. And if they feel bad when they go away because they liked that so much, they're gonna come back again and again and again. But, but Eddie has a secret. He knows that if he keeps doing this release step here, the release and uh, release, relax and smile step, he knows that every time he does the relax a step, he's going to go down again a little bit more and a little bit more. Now, this explains anyone who has been to our retreats. This is explaining to you precisely why this practice or how this practice allows you to experience first, second, third, fourth jhana, and then infinite space and infinite consciousness. How could that possibly happen? Well, this, this, this student here, uh, Freddie, he's going to tell you, I've been doing this for years, and they tell me I could be doing it for many more years before I get to the first jhana. And you know what? I believe him. He's telling the truth. He's not lying. He's telling the truth because he can't lower his tension level. And so he can't ever expect to feel what? To feel uh, this one, the orange one, this one. When the tension begins to rise, he cannot feel it. This guy can't feel it until it comes all the way up here. And he, does, he thinks it's the same as that much. But this guy over here, Eddie over here, when this is coming up, at first he'll feel it at this level, and then the less tension in your body, the sooner you will feel what? You will feel the tension as it's arising. The less tension in your body the sooner you will feel the craving happen now we can demonstrate this with kids who have uh depressive order disorders and um who have a kind of where they fall into it there's maybe something off in the diet or there's something off in the exercise of vitamins and they fall. If you have a child at school, a teacher should look out for this because the child's really happy. It's not really an early bipolar. Bipolars are not usually detected until teenage years, but, but there are conditions that are types of, um, acute types of, de uh, of uh, depressive disorders that you can watch them happening in a kindergarten class or a Sunday school class. And you'll see the child is very happy and then the child falls, ooh, very sad. And they're very sad. And then all of a sudden happy and then ooh, sad, sad. And why are they doing this? Because they don't have enough information about how this works. And even young children can be taught to realize this picture. So as long as Eddie keeps doing the, re the relax, smile, and come back, as long as he keeps doing that, he's lowering this. Now, does that mean that when you come to one retreat, and you get it down, way down here, and you maybe are in infinite space, infinite consciousness, and uh, even nothingness way down here, way deep. Does that mean it's going to stay with you? Well, we have to introduce you to that famous word that I tell you so often. This one word, it makes our life simpler. It causes suffering, but at the same time, it makes it simpler for us to understand something. And that word is... Anicca. I'm very fond of Anicca because I can teach Anicca to someone who is suffering, who is not even a Buddhist. And I can teach them about Anicca clearly. Then they begin to understand that in Sunday school, if they heard Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, what did it really mean? The Anicca meant that everything is impermanent. What does that mean? 
It means everything is changing all the time. It's moving. It's in flux. The whole universe is in flux. You are in flux. I am in flux. Flux means not still, means changing all the time. So when the taxi driver I introduced to the Dhamma, he was, um, I think he's a Muslim, and we're in the car and we're just talking and I got in the car and I had one hour drive from Colombo to get back to where my temple was. And usually I sit back in the seat. I like the taxi drive because while I'm in the city, I can check my email and then it disappears. And the second half hour, I can just chill in the back seat. But when I got in this particular taxi, something happened. And what it was, was the driver was very upset and he was angry. And he was on the phone and I closed my book in the back and said, hmm, this man... He is suffering in the front seat. What can I do for him? You know? And then I realized he wasn't Muslim. He was a Buddhist. I saw the Buddha on the front, little on the front part of the dashboard. And I said to him, um, what seems to be the trouble? Uh, you know, what seems to be the trouble? You seem very upset. He hung up the phone. He was talking to someone and he said, Oh, I, you know, I'm just angry. And I said, well, why are you angry? And he said, I'm angry because someone got in my car. And those people who got in the car, uh, they, they, the man, he told me how to drive my taxi. He told me how to go fast and how to go slow and where to turn. He told me how to go to where I wanted to, I was supposed to take him. He made me so mad. And I said, well, are you, are you still upset? Well, of course that man, he told me what to do and this is my taxi and he shouldn't tell me what to do. It's my taxi, my world. He shouldn't do that. He should have gotten out. And I said, oh, you just told your wife about that? And he said, yeah, of course I told my wife because that man, I said, okay, I, I don't need to hear about what he did <laughs> again, uh, but you're telling me that you were upset. Now you have your wife upset. Let's look at what happened. You, you know, if you're Buddhist, do you, do you remember in Sunday school? He said, yeah, he's driving. And I said, do you remember hearing about Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta? Do you remember that? He said, yeah, I, I remember those words, Anicca, Dukkha, right? Uh, anatta. Uh, and I said, do you know what Anicca means? I said something, something, something about some kind of impermanence. Ah, I said, yeah, that's right. It means everything always changes. That's right. So um, why are you angry at that man? And he said, well, he told me what to do. He told me I had to drive my car this way and go this fast and turn here. I said, I don't, I don't want to hear the story again. I, I know what he did. <laughs> but, but why are you still upset? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you understand everything always changes, why are you upset with this event mm -hmm. that already changed? And he, he kind of looked at me funny in the rear view mirror. He looked at me very funny. And I said, you know, that caused you a lot of, 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 a lot of, uh, suffering because you were happy and he changed your situation and you got suffering. He said, oh yeah, because that I, he, I was so upset. <laughs> so I said, yeah. And then how did you get away? Was well, I'm still not away. And I said, well, that's the third word. You know, this third word is not just sitting there. It's pretty important. This word down here is very important because these two words up here, Anicca and Dukkha, they have to do with suffering. But this word down here, that's the way out. And he said, the way out? Well, what do you mean? I said, you know, the way out is not to be taking all of this so personally. If you were caught with Atta, you would be taking an Atta perspective and take everything as if it was part of you. And that's why you're upset. He said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, 
is the man still here? No, that man got out of the car and he needed to get out of the car. It's okay, he's out of the car, he's gone. But why do you carry this with you now? You're so upset and you don't need to because I'm in the car, <laughs> I'm in the back seat. And I usually get in the car and the taxi driver is happy and we go on a ride back to the temple. And he said, I kind of see, so, so you're telling me, I said, you know, the problem with taxi drivers, he said, what problem? I said, the problem with you guys is you don't know how lucky you are. Now, he looked at me in the mirror again. He said, what do you mean by that? And I said, do you see these buildings here? These big buildings right here, they have no air conditioners. And people work in those in those uh, buildings all day. And there's a set of buildings in Colombo where there are no air conditioners, just fans. It's very hot and they have to suffer. And if somebody doesn't like them and it's a problem and you're there for eight hours a day, think about that. You cannot get away from it. You cannot move away from it. Sounds like lockdown, doesn't it? Sounds like COVID. <laughs> Okay, but here's the thing. You are in full control of your world, but they're not. And he said, what do you mean? I said, look at this car. This is, a, this is a kangaroo cab, a brand new kangaroo cab. It has a movable seat, has air conditioning. You can turn the seat to get out of the car. It's clean inside and the environment is completely controlled by you. You are very, very, very lucky. It's the summer and you are in this taxi. He went, I never thought about it that way. Well, see, now that's part of gratitude. And if you had a little gratitude, you could write down, this is one of the things that I am thankful for, my own environment. And the Buddha gave us a way to have our own environment and our minds create our experience and existence every day. And this is what we don't hear enough about. And it gets very exciting because what you, mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are the states. And from the states come the thoughts and the thoughts into speech and the speech into actions. And so when you're working on your mind in meditation, it is glorious because as you are repairing your mind, you are developing your body and your behavior and your mind at the same time. What you decide your day will be in the morning, that is what happens. You've all heard me say the part in the, uh, in the text about what you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. That's how this works. And the Buddha knows this is how this works and you carry that through. So when you think about something in your mind, then becomes a thought, an intention, verbal speech, action. So what ha who controls your life? Who is it that makes you suffer? That man? Well, that man, you know what he did. I said, I don't want to know what he did. I'm trying to show you. That man is out of the cab. Now you're in the taxi with me. And by the end of this trip, I want to tell you what happened because at the end of the trip, he did not charge me anything. He did not charge me anything. And we said goodbye. Now, there's, th there's 400 taxi drivers in, in Sri Lanka. And so I had, I've done it in, in Kuala Lumpur also. But there's 400 taxi drivers in Sri Lanka. I was there for two and a half years. I never thought I would ever see this man again. But something happened about six months later. I was at the Buddhist bookstore downtown and I called a taxi. And I, when I called the taxi, at, you have to go down the steps, very steep steps, all the way down. And at the bottom, the taxi was there and I had some bags of books for the temple. And I, got, I, I, I couldn't believe it, but the taxi driver, he jumped out and he opened my door. And I got in the taxi and he started smiling in the mirror and I said, hello. I didn't realize who it was at first. And then he said, do you know who I am? I said, no, who, who are you? He said, do you remember that you taught me 
some things about a Nietzsche in, in the taxi, look at my Buddha. And my, his Buddha was sitting on the dashboard with a little thing underneath the Buddha in yellow letters, bright fluorescent yellow letters, Anicca. <laughs> because why? Because he always wanted to remember this word, Anicca. He didn't care about the other ones. If he could just remember Anicca, what is not there, it comes up and happens, and then while it's happening, and then it goes away, that's Anicca. <laughs> and I told him, if you just make a flag, a little flag that looks like this, it looks like this, you know, the kind they used to have at the colleges like this in the beginning, and here it says Anicca. And this is what we should do in Sunday school, we should make a, make a flag, Anicca. You can have like a yellow flag like that. And this flag should be right beside your Brutus flag. And every child should understand Anicca. So when your brother is driving you crazy, I don't care what he's doing. Remember Anicca. <laughs> and then if your sister's fighting with you, I don't care. Anicca, maybe let her have the doll because you know, if she wants the doll or she wants the book, let her have it because why? Because of Anicca. <laughs> And if your mother is getting on your nerves or your father is getting on the son's nerve, just remember, go ahead and do what they want you to do. Why should we do what they want us to do? Because of Anicca. You see, that's a simple thing. And this is a wonderful, wonderful lesson in Buddhism to somebody who couldn't be even Buddhist. And that's where the Muslims, they would ask me what I'm doing and I would start telling them in the taxi and they would listen to me. And many times my taxi drivers were miserable. And the same thing would happen with the lesson about Anicca. Because even the Muslims, even the Jews, even the Christians, even the Catholics, everybody, they know what arises passes away. That's it. And they forget. It's a superfluous thing we taught our kids. It's right on the top of our head, tucked in under our hair and our skull, or back here where we forget. It's, it, we put it in our head. You know what Anicca is, but you never played with it. And now you're in lockdown. So why don't you play with it? It's fun, you know, it's fun. It brings you back to laughing. And if you laugh, you feel good. Of course, this joy cannot stay here. Because of why? Because of uh, Nietzsche. <laughs> right? It's okay, but it's okay for you to feel happy. Somebody said, no, I can't feel happy. I'm a Buddhist. Uh, I said, what? No, I'm not allowed to be happy. Buddhists are all like, mm. Mm. no, 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 no. No, no, we are the happy ones. Why are we happy? Because we understand Anicca. That's why we understand that the change, if we don't understand Anicca, it can bring us suffering. And the way out of it is not to take it personally, but just to remember Anicca. Okay, now here's the last part. When, when I got in the cab and he said, do you remember me? I said, yes, and he said, well, I remember you. And he said to me, and my wife loves you. <laughs> thinking, what does your wife have to do with this whole thing? And he said, well, when you taught me about Anicca, I went home and my wife my mother-in-law did not want my wife to marry me. She did not like me at all, my whole marriage. And so it's always been a problem if my wife wants to take the children to visit her mother because I go with her, but I hate every minute of it and she's mean to me and all the rest of it. But now it's okay. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, you can remember what he said, Anicca. <laughs> he said, Anicca, because when I go to my mother-in-law's house now, it's okay. She goes inside with the children. They have a good tea. I say hello. I go on the porch with the dog, and I have some iced tea, and I read the paper. It's not a problem anymore. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I had taught this man something valuable for using in life for a religion he had been involved in all his life 
And he only believed before he met me that that was something that was there because the mothers and his wife, they want to go to the temple and they want to do merit. And that's all there was. It didn't have anything to do with me, with my life at all. Nothing. Okay. And then all of a sudden he realized if he learned a little bit deeper what this things meant that he was exposed to, maybe it would be something would help him in his everyday life. So, so this is in a story, this is just a, not just an answer to a question, how do you feel this tension? You practice the six R's, you practice them, you practice the six R's, and every time it goes lower. Now, when you finish this retreat, Eddie's going to go home, and he's going to have a higher amount of, he's going to have a higher amount of tension again, when he goes back out on the street until he eventually develops his mind, body, and his environment come into balance, he's gonna be stabilized with what you call more equanimity, more balance. But until that, he knows that he is working towards a goal and that next time he comes to a retreat, it was interesting because the next time he comes to a retreat, maybe he'll start, maybe his, uh, maybe his practice will start about here. And you guys who are, uh, practicing steadily, I bet you it has gotten down to here. And the moment you sit on the cushion, some people say it just drops to this level and I start there. And people who have been working very much in the deep states, they say, oh, I don't have any problem. I don't have to do this and this and this and this anymore. My brain learned I can do this and it's a safe thing to do and it's comfortable. So when I sit, I go right to this level and I start working and stabilizing and then I might drop one more level. See, that's progress. That's real progress. But that doesn't happen for everybody unless one thing, unless you understand what Bhante's always telling you, life is meditation and meditation is life. This is why we say that. Because the meditation's teaching you how to ride a bike, for instance. Somebody teaches you to ride a bike. Fine, so you can ride to your grandmother's and back. That's great, you know, but if you're gonna decide to ride the bike 150 miles across the state, you better do more than just learn the basics of just pedaling and braking, because there's a lot more to it for you to keep going physically and shifting gears and changing speeds and the whole thing, getting your, you know, a drink while you're riding and everything so that you can go long distances, you see? So you, any sport, anything you learn, any kind of skill you learn in life, you have levels of understanding and degrees of development as you go along, okay? There were no secret teachings in the Buddhist tradition. No secret teachings. And yet today, this is another discussion we can have sometime about, I talk about slippage, but I don't get to tell you many times what I'm talking about, all the different things I found in 20 years that slipped from being one thing into another thing that was much lower, much unclearer, much more like useless to know instead of useful in life. And it's a shame, but that's another conversation. I'm almost done here. But what you, this person is basically asking then, what, they're, what is they're basically asking, okay, um, is they're really, what they were talking about is how do I get to feel that? And what I'm showing you here is that when, you, when you're practicing, if you're using TWIM properly, if you're using the uh, release, uh, or let go, relax, smile, come back, right? When you let go, you have to then relax. Re relax and it drops. And then the next time during that session or during the next one in the retreat, as you go along, you know, um, then what's happening is you are diminishing it less and less and less until finally you can do what I'm saying to you in your practice. When you sit down, you can just sit down and start you can say, I'm going to sit no higher than X, and you probably won't. 
can't guarantee it's going to be that way every time, but you, you probably, you won't sit any higher than the second John or any higher than the fourth John or whatever. If you say that before you start sitting, you probably won't because your brain, your mind is starting to cooperate with you. You're setting up a team relationship between your body and your mind. And when it starts working together, it's a wonderful thing. And this practice is also wonderful because if you learn even a little bit of it, it's like, okay, so I only went to one retreat or I did an online retreat, then I, did, I followed some instructions. You know what? You did drop the stick or the leaf into the river. You might not have walked along and followed it all the way to the ocean, but the little stick is now floating down the river and it can get to the ocean if you pay attention and you don't let it get caught on the side of the river or the stream. If it keeps going, it will just go down and it'll keep going until it gets to the ocean. Yeah, so this is the way, this is the actual way that, um, that uh, it, it works. And I wanna show you one thing, uh, just read one thing to you and then we'll go get Bonte. Um, I'm gonna take the very tail end because I really like it so much. In the Book of Causation, we go and find, um, let's see, where is that? We find the Upanisa Sutta, the way the Upanisa Sutta ends. And it's very, very special. I'm probably gonna have to make it up for you instead of doing it exactly, because I'll have to read it to you next time. Um, okay, I'm gonna just do it for you real quick. At the end of the Upanisa Sutta, the Upanisa Sutta is a path of development the Buddha left us, your entire path of development, meaning from the time you are uh, starting to, to suffer and how all the suffering operates. And then there's a path of development that starts with just the first time you sit down all the way to Nibbana. And this is a, a uh, like the 12 links in dependent origination, but there's 24 links and it's called transcendental dependent origination. And it is a development chart. And we really love the fact that we were able to find that and use it to show people a developmental chart. But at the end of that chart, the Buddha said a very simple thing about when it rains on top of a mountain, the rain comes down and hits the rocks and the droplets turn into little tiny rivulets and they turn into rivulets turn into pools and the pools start to go down the mountain and the water starts to go downhill and it goes through the forest till it comes to the stream and the stream flows down further into the river and the river flows into a confluence with a larger river and the river then flows down into the ocean. And in the same way, when you're learning your meditation and you're learning the Dhamma with it at the same time, you start to see how all these pieces operate. And now we gave the one little thing, Anicca Dukkha Anatta, the simplest one, to the taxi driver. And he went away and he didn't keep it to himself. I bet you he told it to many people along the way because he told it to his wife and he changed his marriage and the kids were happier, he told me, because he wasn't in there fighting with the grandmother. <laughs> You know, and everything changed for him. So just by learning a little bit of Dhamma that could be transferred into life, he had this experience. Now he changed his life beyond that and whoever he shares it with. And it all happened because of this flag. This is all that happened. Oh, we have a new kind of thing here. Let's see. Whoops, okay. This flag right here, right? Anicca. This is the Anicca flag. So that is your lesson from me today, the Anicca flag. Okay. And I think Bonte's going to come in. Here is the, whoops, we're not allowed to write. I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. <laughs> here. There it is. Anicca. Every kid needs to make one of these in Sunday school. Everybody needs to be having an Anicca 
on their on their sweatshirt, on their t-shirt. Everybody needs to stop worrying, stop fighting, let it go. Relax, smile, come back. That's Twim, Sadhu. I'm gonna go get Bunty. Okay, they have the practice on them. <laughs> Whoops, okay. Whoops, oh, I'm doing this wrong. Oh, I pushed all the wrong buttons. Um, okay, I don't know how to get back. How do we do it? Here we go. How do we do it? <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. Um, I'll try to find out oh, once again. I don't know how to make it bigger. <laughs> oh, there. Okay. Now, the thing with this particular sutta is that uh, it starts talking about a kind of meditation that was developed by the Hindus and it's called the Kasina meditation and it's good for one-pointed concentration and I have practiced this before but it's not so good for using the six R's. So I'm going to change the talk of the Kasina meditation to the Brahma Viharas. Okay. So I'm going to talk more about the Brahma Viharas today. Oh dear. Do you have a power pack in place? In there. Mm -hmm. In there. Eventually, we'll get going. Okay, <clears throat> now the sutta tonight is sutta number 121, the Chula Sunyata Sutta, the shorter discourse on voidness. And it's amazing how many different people have different definitions of what voidness is. Now, tonight you're going to listen to what the Buddha says voidness is, which is quite different than the idea of there's nothing at all. It's just void of anything. That's not what voidness is describing. So, thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in the eastern park in the palace of Megara's mother. Then when it was evening, the Venerable Ananda rose from meditation, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, 
Venerable sir, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country where there is a town of the Sakyans named Nagaraga. There, Venerable Sir, I heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips. Now, Ananda, I often abide in voidness. Did I hear that correctly, Venerable Sir? Did I learn that correctly? Attend to that correctly. Remember that correctly. Certainly, Ananda, you heard that correctly, learned that correctly, attended to that correctly, and remembered it correctly. As formally, Ananda, so now too, I often abide in voidness. Ananda, just as this palace of Megara's mother is void of elephants, cattle, horses, and mares, void of gold and silver, void of the assembly of men and women. And there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the Sangha of monks. So too, a monk not attending to the perception of a village not attending to the perception of people, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. His mind enters into that perception of forest and acquires confidence and steadiness and resolution. So what are we talking about here? When it's, it says that there is void of all these elephants and, and cattle and all of this kind of stuff, and it's void of a village, it means that they are not there in your mind at that time. But you still have things in your mind, and it's the perception of a forest. So you give up the perception of cattle, you give up the perception of a village. Now the only thing that's in your mind is the perception of a forest. So it's void of these, these things and there's still something there. And it's that way all the way through the jhanas. If you're void of the first jhana, then the only thing that's present is the second jhana. You'll see in just a, a minute or two. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of a village, <coughs> those are not present here. Whatever disturbance there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the forest. He understands this field of perception. Is void of the perception of a forest or of a village. This field of perception is void of the perception of people. There is present only this non-voidness. 
namely the singleness dependent on the perception of a forest. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what is, what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, a monk is not attending to the perception of people, not attending to the perception of forest. He attends the singleness dependent on the perception. Now, this is where it goes to the casina the earth casina, and it talks about that. And the reason that I don't want to use this example is it's very confusing. And it causes all kinds of confusion because people say, a casina, oh, I want to try that. I want to do that for a while. It is a very difficult practice. And it takes a lot of effort and energy to keep your mind focused just on one thing at a time. You don't really teach yourself very much when you're just focusing on one thing at a time. And you, you don't use the six R's with it. It just doesn't work. Could we turn the air conditioner? Sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say loving kindness. So the singleness dependent on loving kindness. His mind enters into the perception of loving kindness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. Just as a bull's hide becomes dense. Wait a minute. Just as, as a bull's hide becomes dense. Steadiness and resolution. It becomes free from folds and free and is fully stretched out with a hundred pigs. So too, a monk not attending to any of the ridges and hollows, not attending to any of the distractions of loving kindness, stays with the feeling, stays with that smiling mind. And sharp mindfulness, that's what the resolution is all about, is sharpening your mindfulness with the loving kindness. Any kind of hindrance that arises and pulls your attention away from the loving kindness. Use the six R's. Recognize, release, relax, smile. Come back to the loving kindness and stay with that as long as you can. When you do that, your mind enters into the perception of the loving kindness and acquires confidence and steadiness, equanimity, balance, and resolution. He understands thus, 
whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of a forest, those are not present here. There's present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of loving kindness. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of people. This field of perception is void of the perception of forest. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of loving kindness. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not present, not there, but as to what remains there. He understands that which is present thus. This is present. This is loving kindness. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of forest, not attending to the perception of loving kindness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of compassion with infinite space. His mind enters into that perception of the base of compassion with infinite space and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of forest, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of loving kindness, that is not present here. There's present only this amount of disturbance namely the singleness dependent on the perception of compassion and the base of infinite space. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of forest. This field of perception is void of the perception of loving kindness. There's present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of compassion and the base of infinite space. Now one of the things that's happened over the years in Buddhism is there's been divisions that are happening quite a bit. One of the big divisions is the division between the first four jhanas that you can experience and the immaterial jhanas that you can experience. When I first started doing meditation, of course, jhana was very poorly thought of and everybody was told that they should be afraid of the jhanas. 
But over the years, as I began studying more and actually getting better with my own practice, and seeing that the word jhana does not mean absorption concentration. It does not mean just staying on one object at a time. Jhanas are levels of understanding. So you understand as you go deeper and deeper in your practice. You go from the first jhana to the second jhana. Your understanding is, is much better, more clear, more alert. You go from the second jhana to the third jhana. Now, each one of these different jhana levels are different kinds of meditation. You still have the same object of meditation. So when you start out, you're still, you're doing the first jhana, you're doing loving kindness, you're doing loving kindness for the second jhana, you're doing loving kindness for the third jhana, you're doing loving kindness in the fourth jhana. But each one of those has a different result of doing the meditation that way. And then when you go into the immaterial jhanas, where there is no more body, and you're not paying attention to your body anymore, you're staying with compassion, joy, equanimity. These are called the Brahma Viharas. These are mental realms. Now, when I first started out, it was thought that if you wanted to get to these immaterial jhanas, it's going to take you many hard years of practice. Because you're doing a one-pointed kind of concentration. But when, when I found out about the importance of the relaxed step, and I started seeing that well, I was, I was completely shocked when I started teaching people about the suttas because I was reading the suttas. And I started seeing that their progress was so fast that I had a hard time keeping up. It was amazing. After one or two days, people were getting into the first jhana. And always before, it's like my one friend that's teaching one-pointed concentration, they ask him, how long does it take to get into the first jhana? He said, well, if you meditate every day, if you sit at least once a day, twice a day is better, and you're really serious about doing it, then it's going to take you about a year. A year to get into the first jhana. Now that's truly amazing. But that's that's what I grew up with. That's, that's what I was told from the very beginning of practice. And I pretty much all that those guys I would do for periods of time and I do I did. 
didn't see any true advantage of having the kind of concentration. I wasn't working very much at all. So when I started practicing with the relaxed step, I started teaching the relaxed step. Having the students able to get into the first jhana that took me so long, I was shocked and I, I almost felt like, well, I don't really believe you. Nobody does it that fast. But as more and more people started doing this and going into this, end of the jhanas I became a real believer and I was doing it myself and seeing that I was going into these deeper states really quickly so when I started talking about getting into all of these different jhanas and the voidness you're not void. When, when you get out of the second jhana, you're void of the second jhana, then you experience the third jhana. That's the only non-voidness that you have in your mind at that time. When I started noticing this more and more, I was very... Um, thrilled to see so many people gaining so much advantage and they were they were so much more happy now one of the problems that that happened with people that were doing one pointed concentration is that they started thinking because of the way they were being taught well they're they're pretty good they, they they're uh a really good meditators because they could get to the second jhana they could get to the third jhana and they'd walk around puff their chest up and tell everybody how good they were When I went to Korea, there was a lady that had done a bunch of meditation before she came to me, but it was one point of concentration. And she had very, very heavy pride. I can get into the fourth jhana. And she said that with such pride, it was, I was amazed. And then I said, so you're acting like this is some kind of big deal it's not because you're doing a different kind of meditation than i am and you're staying attached to that kind of meditation you're not learning from me if you don't want to practice what i'm showing you and you want to keep practicing what you already have uh, know then you're wasting my time and my energy. So go find your other teacher. The importance of you being able to keep your, uh, keep following the directions can't be overstated. Follow the directions as closely as you can, and you will see for yourself in a very short period of time, your personality starts to become softer. Your mind becomes more balanced, and you start having more fun in your life. That's really important.
So I'm going to go on with the sutta. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there. Whatever practice you're doing, as you progress with that particular level, let's go and you go to another level, you're void of that, that first level. What? I didn't hear what you said. Can you hear okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, Monte. Okay. Yes. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of loving kindness, not attending to the perception of compassion and the base of infinite space, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of joy and the base of infinite consciousness. Infinite consciousness is actually a very interesting state because this shows you that anicca, dukkha, anatta is real. It's not a philosophy. When I was doing so much uh, Burmese style meditation, they were drowning or drumming that into my head. But I never really saw it clearly. I didn't, I intellectually, I knew what it was, but with direct experience, I didn't. When you get to the state of infinite consciousness, at one of the sense doors, at the eyes or ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, mind, you're going to see very fast flickering. Now, you've heard me say this before, I'm sure. But when I go and you hear that sound, you're hearing about a hundred thousand arising and passing away of sound consciousness. When you get your mind starts to get into the state of infinite consciousness, you're starting to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away, arise and pass away. And it's real important for you to understand that that's what's happening right at that time. You're seeing rebirth. This is what the Buddha taught. He never taught reincarnation. Reincarnation is Hindu philosophy. Rebirth is seeing individual consciousnesses be born, arise, and pass away, die. So you're seeing continually birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. And when you see it this way, you really start to realize that what the Buddha is talking about is not just empty words. This is what you can experience. You also see 
that because there's this movement that's happening all the time, it's kind of unsatisfactory. It is a, a form of suffering. And you will get to understand that a little bit later when you go deeper into your meditation. But you'll see that there it is a disturbance. And you're going to see that everything that occurs in your life is impersonal. It's not you. It's not yours. And this is where you're starting to develop a pure mind. A mind that doesn't have any craving in it. You can see things as they truly are. So when you see Anicca Dukkha Anatta in the realm of infinite consciousness, it's taking away the philo philosophy and is showing you exactly what is happening. I've got the hiccups all of a sudden. Oh, sorry, I thought you had it. I thought you had water. No. So, having this direct knowledge is really teaching you a massive lesson for every every part of your life. I know Kino was talking about impermanence so much today. Well, this is not just talking. It's when you start realizing that this is something that's important for you to understand you become more happy. And the more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes and you see more and more clearly the Anicca Dukkha Anatta of life. Okay, with each of these different levels that it's talking about here, it says that you acquire confidence. The more deeply you, you see and understand how Anicca Dukkha Anatta work, the more confidence you have and the easier it is to watch. Mm -hmm. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of loving kindness, <coughs> those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. Those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance. Namely, the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness with joy. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of loving kindness. 
this field of perception is void of the perception of compassion and the base of infinite space. This field, of, there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of joy with infinite consciousness. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of, of compassion with infinite space, not attending to the perception of the base of joy with infinite consciousness, attends to that singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. His mind enters into that uh, equanimity and the perception of the base of nothingness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of compassion and the base of infinite space, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of joy and the base of infinite consciousness. Those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance. Now, as you keep going deeper and deeper into the meditation, you're starting to sit for longer periods of time and just staying on your object of meditation. When you get to the realm of nothingness, that's why I'd start encouraging you to start sitting for three hours or more and staying with your object of meditation, which is equanimity and the realm of nothingness. So you can sit sometimes for half an hour, 40 minutes, even up to an hour without any other disturbance, except the disturbance that is the equanimity, the tranquility that you're feeling in the quiet mind. So there's present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of equanimity and the base of nothingness. He understands this field of the base of uh, compassion. is void. Uh, let me read this over again. This field of the perception is void of the field of the perception of the base of infinite space. This field of perception is void of 
the joy and perception of the base of infinite consciousness. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness with equanimity. Thus he regards it as void as of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of infinite consciousness, joy with the base of infinite consciousness, not attending to the perception of equanimity and the base of nothingness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. His mind enters into that perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbance there might be dependent on the perception of joy and the base of infinite consciousness. Those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on equanimity and the base of nothingness. Those are not present here. There's present only this amount of disturbance namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Now this is a real interesting state to be in. And probably 75% of the students that do a retreat with me will get into that that realm, that very, very subtle realm of neither perception nor non-perception. And it's quite wonderful to see because your mind becomes very much more clear. You're able to sit without any disturbance in your mind at all. I call this the quiet mind. And when you come and do a retreat with me, that's one of the questions I ask you is, are you into the quiet mind? How long can you stay with the quiet mind? At first, you don't stay very long, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. But as you get more confidence and you, you get more uh, more clear about what quiet mind is, you start really appreciating that quiet mind. Very, very nice. And your mind is very open and relaxed. So, so this field of the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, he understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of joy with infinite consciousness. This field of perception is void 
of the base perception of the base of equanimity with nothingness. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. The reason that they, they talk about this particular level of meditation is your mind becomes so subtle it's hard to see whether something is there or not. And this is a stage that occurs right before you attain Nibbana. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus Ananda, this too is his genuine undistorted pure descent into voidness. Again Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of equanimity with nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless collectedness of mind. That is when your mind You're in this state, but you don't know you're in this state. This is called the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And this is the signless collectedness of mind. He understands thus, Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of equanimity and the base of nothingness, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. So it's not that you die from this, your body will stay alive for up to seven days without any disturbance at all. Okay. So thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of equanimity with nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless collectedness of mind. His mind enters into that signless collectedness of mind and acquires confidence uh, steadfastness and resolution. 
he understands thus. This signless collectedness of mine is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire. <coughs> Where was I? Oh, from the from the taint of being and from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming to any state of being. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of sensual desire, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of being, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of ignorance, those are not present here. There's present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. He understands this field of perception is void of the taint of sensual desire. This field of perception is void of the taint of being. This field of perception is void of the taint of ignorance. There is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understand, understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness, supreme and unsurpassed. Ananda, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all entered upon and abided in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will enter and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all will enter upon and abide in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all enter upon and abide in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Therefore, Ananda, you should train thus. We will enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. That is what the Blessed One said. 
the venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this is a lot different kind of definition about voidness than most people realize. Because they're taking like a regular dictionary definition. And the Buddha's, his definitions of a lot of the words that he uses, <clears throat> his definitions are different than a standard dictionary. So when people rely on standard dictionary, like the word ignorance, uh, the word ignorance in Buddhism means that you don't see and truly understand how the Four Noble Truths actually work. And ignorance in a regular dictionary, it means that you, you just are not educated. You, you, you have a lot to learn. And the word that uh, the uh, the Brahmins and the Hindus use that they call enlightenment. Well, enlightenment can have so many different meanings. And generally people take it as some kind of a spectacular experience. Oh, I'm enlightened. Well, if I tell you something you don't understand or don't know about, I've enlightened you. So instead of saying that you become enlightened when you attain Nibbana, I much prefer you become awake. Because you are awakened. You've been in a sleep for how many lifetimes and gotten confused and suffered so much. then your mind becomes lighter. Your understanding of how things actually work becomes clearer. So it's a real important thing to, for me at least, to use certain words in certain ways so that you can become more and more clear about becoming awake. What is Nibbana? I've had many students that argue with me that there's only one kind of Nibbana. And then that was with Burmese teachers I was arguing. But there's more than one kind of Nibbana. There's a mundane Nibbana, there's a super mundane Nibbana. The super mundane is the one where it purifies you and you stay purified. The mundane is learning how to let go of craving and not be caught up in, in that. And I also give a lot of definitions when I give Dhamma talks, the definition for mindfulness, remembering to observe how mind's attention moves. There was a couple of very famous teachers that they became offended when I, I used that def, those definitions. And I listened to the definitions that they were giving and they weren't giving definitions. You're supposed to know what mindfulness is. 
So it's, the thing is, listen with your heart. And if it agrees with what you feed, see in your heart, then use it. So I've been talking for a long time <laughs> with all of you. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear structure just be. May the grieving shed all grief in the end. May all beings bear this scenario they have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings also have Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you. Have a good weekend and have fun. Thank you for thinking. Thank you, Venerable Kema. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bante. Yes. Keep your phone number. Okay. I think this is... Sister Kema should have it. I'll share it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to I wanna talk to you a bit. Okay, sure. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.